Chapter 12 of the Story of Geronimo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Story of Geronimo by Jim Kajilgard. Chapter 12 Flight into Mexico the lowering sun scorched Camp Goodwin, the United States Army fort on St. Carlos Reservation. But despite the sun, Geronimo had been sitting near the fort all day, as he had sat for the past six days, with a Navajo blanket draped about him and his fastest pony near at hand. He wanted the Indian agent at Camp Goodwin, a man named Hoge, to become accustomed to his sitting thus, so that Hoge would pay no attention to him. On this seventh day, plans that had been more than a year in making were at last as perfect as they ever would be. Swift action lay ahead. Geronimo's blanket hid a Winchester repeating rifle and bullet-filled belts. He watched a little group of Apaches, all mounted, riding southward. Nobody else paid any attention. The group might have been going hunting or wood-gathering. Geronimo returned his attention to Camp Goodwin. Two Apache chiefs, named Loco and Nana, with most of their people, were gathered near the building. They all knew that Geronimo and another leader, Woa, were about to make a break for Mexico with sixty warriors and a hundred and sixty women and children. Loco and Nana wanted to be sure that the agent could see them near the fort and know that they were taking no part in this break. Geronimo wanted to make sure that neither chief told Hoge of the forthcoming flight. If there was any sign that they intended to betray his plans for escape, Geronimo would shoot them, and Loco and Nana both knew it. Planning the flight had not been easy and when the plans were made it had been necessary to choose the right time for the break. There would never be a better one than this afternoon. Many of the soldiers usually stationed at Camp Goodwin were away. Some were campaigning in New Mexico, some were hunting outlaw Apaches who had been reported near the Arizona-Mexico border. Woa had left early this morning to wait in a dry wash some miles to the south. All day long Apaches had been quietly drifting out to join him. They intended to start just before dark so that they would have all night before the soldiers still in Camp Goodwin could take their trail. Geronimo's eyes narrowed. Loco and Nana and their followers had done nothing. But the man named Sterling, chief of San Carlos Police, now rode up with some Apache policemen. Had someone betrayed the careful plans, or had Sterling intended to bring his Apache police to Camp Goodwin anyhow? The son told Geronimo that it was a little past four o'clock. He rose, still keeping the rifle hidden under his blanket. He walked to his pony and was preparing to mount when the man named Sterling shouted, Hey you, wait! Pretending he did not know that he was being addressed, Geronimo did not look around. Sterling shouted again, I mean you, Geronimo. Stop or I'll shoot. Geronimo sprang to the saddle, dropping his blanket as he did so. Sterling's rifle cracked and a bullet sang close. Leveling his own rifle from the back of the already running pony, Geronimo flung a shot at Sterling. He bent low on his pony's back to make a smaller target as bullets from Sterling's Apache police whistled past. Then he galloped over a hill and was hidden. Geronimo raced into the dry wash where the rest awaited him. All the warriors were on foot and holding their horses. The women and children were mounted, and some of the women held tightly to babies not yet old enough to ride alone. Most children, often with three on the same pony, managed their own mounts. 
Woa, an Indian so big that he dwarfed the wiry little pony he rode, came to meet Geronimo. What news do you bring? Woa asked. Geronimo said, The man named Sterling came with his Apache police. He shot at me and I shot at him, but I do not know if I hit him. The soldiers must know soon that we are gone. Come, the warriors mounted with an advance and rear guard and scouts on either side men women and children rode on at a fast trot night fell and they were safe until the sun rose again but sunrise might find soldiers hot on their trail so there could be no thought of sparing horses the only sleep they dare allow themselves was such snatches as might be had in the saddle from time to time they nibbled a bit of the parched corn or jerky, sun-dried beef that they carried in pouches. With daylight, Geronimo reined in on top of a hill and looked behind him. There were no soldiers in sight and no cloud of dust to indicate that they were coming. Geronimo turned and overtook Woa. Nobody comes from the rear, he said, but we shall be in trouble soon. Our mounts reel from weariness. Yes, Woa grunted. Neither said more. Both had known that they and their people must travel fast, and both had also known that their horses and ponies could not run all the way to Mexico. They did not know yet what they would do when the animals were played out. Some Apaches were asleep in the saddle and now the fastest must suit their gait to the slowest. A pony stumbled, almost went down, then found his balance and pounded on. Suddenly Geronimo pointed ahead and exclaimed, Look, Usan has smiled upon us. A long pack train with some horses and mules bearing packs and many more running loose was making its way up the valley. Knowing how to get the last burst of speed from his tired pony, Geronimo whooped and sped to the attack. He began to shoot as soon as he was in range, and he heard the rifles of the rest of the warriors blasting behind him. The white men and Mexicans with them were outnumbered six to one. They fired a few hasty return shots and spurred out of danger leaving their pack train and loose horses behind them. Letting the fleeing men go, Geronimo rode in ahead of the frightened horses and turned them. The warriors surrounded the herd. There was a quick exchange of saddles and bridles, a swift rummaging through all the packs for priceless rifles and bullets, and most of the Apaches rode on. Freshly mounted, Geronimo returned to the top of a hill for another look at the back trail. He could see neither soldiers nor the telltale dust cloud to indicate any were coming. Geronimo hurried to catch Woa. No soldiers are near enough to cause trouble from the rear, he reported. So rather than go on at full speed, it would be wise to ride these fresh horses at a pace they can maintain. Wise indeed, Woa said, but let us not forget that some soldiers are elsewhere and even now may be returning to Camp Goodwin. We must be alert for whoever approaches from the front. Geronimo said, you speak wisely. Alternately, walking and trotting their mounts, they rode steadily toward Mexico. That day they stopped only long enough to let the thirsty Apache horses drink from a water hole. A herd of range horses was already drinking there, and they took those horses with them when they went on. Into the night they traveled and stopped again for two hours at another water hole. The horses drank and grazed. Some of the weariest people slept. Geronimo, who often had been afield a full week with only such sleep as he could get in the saddle, climbed a hill to look for danger on the back trail. The next day, riding as advance scout, Geronimo saw soldiers coming a moment before they saw him. 
there were two companies about sixty men of the fourth cavalry and they were directly in the path of the apaches must follow geronimo waved his rifle as a signal that enemies were sighted and the warriors whooped to join him this was apache country a land in which they were familiar with every rock and crevice and to the west was a bypass around the soldiers driving the loose horses at full run the women and children raced toward that bypass yelling but not shooting because they had no bullets to waste the warriors swooped down on the soldiers it looked as though they intended to have a hand-to-hand -hand fight with them again geronimo could not help admiring american soldiers who never ran as mexicans so often did but always stood their ground however the apache charge was a trick suddenly the racing indians swerved east towards some rocky hills they rode up a narrow cleft the only one around which horses could climb the soldiers shot but the range was so long that they hit no one reaching the summit of the cleft the apaches took their horses behind some rocks where they would be safe from bullets then they scrambled back to take up positions in the rocks themselves the soldiers launched a spirited attack but they could not advance under the withering fire rained down upon them they retreated reformed and attacked again the apaches shot slowly and carefully for they wanted neither a fierce battle nor close quarter fighting their only purpose was to delay the soldiers until the women and children had had time to reach a place of safety two hours after the soldiers first opened fire the apaches began to slip away each mounted his own horse and each took a different path to rejoin the women and children finally only geronimo and a dozen others were left they fired at the soldiers and drove them to cover in the rocks then all the remaining apaches rose and ran to their horses on their next attack the soldiers took the hilltop there was not an apache left to resist them but there were sixty different trails that led in sixty different directions forty-eight hours after they had left san carlos the apaches crossed the mexican border and were safe in the sierra madre mountains end of chapter twelve